Words are fun, aren't they? Here are two words you've probably never seen before, but which have some very particular definitions. This first word, autological, is a term denoting any word that describes itself. So, for instance, the word polysyllabic, itself being a polysyllabic word, can be classified as autological. In contradistinction, a word such as monosyllabic, which is obviously not a monosyllable word, doesn't describe itself. This latter type of word we term heterological. Other examples of autological words include pronounceable, unhyphenated, noun, etc. Their heterological counterparts would be unpronounceable, hyphenated, adjective, and so on. Words less related to language, like dog or chair, obviously don't describe themselves, and so also fall under the heterological category. Thus, for any given word X, if X describes itself, it is autological. Otherwise, by definition, X is heterological. We now propose a simple statement for your consideration. All words are either autological or not autological, i.e. heterological. Do you agree with this statement? Think carefully, because if you answered yes, you agree, then great. Guess what? You just broke logic. This is dialect with the Grelling Nelson Paradox. Can every word in a language always be sorted into two distinct categories? It sure seems that way. Just start by picking any arbitrary category, then whatever doesn't fit into that category simply place into an opposite leftovers category. So if your category was words that begin with S, we can just find all the words in our language that begin with S, sort those, then toss everything else into a does not begin with S bin and call it a day. But something really funny happens if we try this same tactic with the categories of autological and heterological. Specifically, if we sort words into these two categories, we can do so with every word in the English language except for two, the words autological and heterological themselves. When we try to sort these words, that is, when we ask, are autological and heterological themselves autological or heterological words, there arises a paradox known as the Grelling-Nelson paradox, named for the German logicians who founded it in the early 20th century. In a nutshell, the paradox goes like this. Consider first the word heterological. We know that this word must be either autological or heterological, so let's start by assuming it's autological. Well, then this implies that heterological is a word which falls under its own definition category, meaning it's a word which does not describe itself, meaning it's actually heterological, contrary to the starting assumption. So now instead we assume heterological is heterological, meaning it doesn't fall under its own definition category, i.e. it does not not describe itself. But of course, this means it does describe itself and is therefore autological, contrary to the starting assumption. Therefore, heterological, and from a similar line of reasoning, autological, are fundamentally unsortable words. Okay, if you were able to follow that, congrats, you're a natural logician. The rest of us, however, are sitting here with our eyeballs crossed, wondering what the heck just happened. Well, it's actually pretty easy to see if we just take things a little slower and write out some simple sentences. Let's start by noting that, for any given word X in the English language, one of the following two sentences must be true. 1. The word X describes itself. 2. The word X does not describe itself. 
Let's term this principle the fact that a word either describes itself or doesn't, the principle of bivalency. Next, let's make the meaning of describes itself a little more explicit by turning these sentences into grammatical formulas. Let X be any arbitrary word, and let Y be the definition of that word as it applies to other words. Then we have the word X is a word that Y. The word X is not a word that Y. This generalization allows us to simplify the procedure for determining whether any given word is autological or heterological. For instance, substituting the word polysyllabic along with its definition contains more than one syllable into the formula yields the following two sentences. The word polysyllabic is a word that contains more than one syllable. The word polysyllabic is not a word that contains more than one syllable. Now, here we can easily determine the first sentence to be the true one, indicating the word polysyllabic is autological. If instead, the second sentence were the true one, as in the case where we substituted in monosyllabic, then the word would be heterological. We can also modify this formula slightly in order to encompass words that don't describe other words, such as in the case chair. Via this formula, we are now capable of sorting any given word in the English language into its respective autological or heterological category. All right, now let's tackle the paradox by inserting the words autological and heterological themselves into these formulas. Let's start by assuming that the first formula, the autological case, is the correct one. Inserting in autological and heterological, along with the respective definitions, yields the following sentences. The word autological is a word that describes itself. The word heterological is a word that does not describe itself. Now note that the first sentence can be rewritten as the word autological is autological. This checks out since it is consistent with our initial assumption that autological was autological. So far so good, but now look at the sentence the word heterological is a word that does not describe itself. Well, a word that doesn't describe itself is simply what defines the heterological category, meaning we can rewrite this sentence as the word heterological is heterological. This is bad because by starting out under the assumption that heterological was an ontological word, we managed to prove, in fact, that heterological is actually a heterological word. This blatant contradiction requires us to conclude that our initial assumption was wrong. Heterological cannot be sorted into the ontological category. Well, not a huge deal, right? Let's just sort heterological into the heterological category. But here, the exact same contradiction arises. According to the heterological formula, we can now form the sentence, the word heterological is not a word that does not describe itself. Again, substituting in the definition for heterological, this becomes, the word heterological is not heterological. Or, in other words, the word heterological is ontological. A conclusion which again contradicts our initial assumption. So, no matter what category we attempt to sort heterological into, we always must conclude that it belongs to the opposite category, resulting in a back and forth, infinite dance between classifications. Similarly, we find that the word ontological can be sorted into both categories, which is also a contradiction. This means the words heterological and ontological are inherently unsortable. And so our assumption that every word can be sorted into either ontological or heterological categories is falsified. But how can this be? If a word isn't ontological, then it must be not ontological, meaning heterological. 
there isn't any other option. Yet these wards stubbornly refuse to adhere to any such bivalent classification, leaving us with a headache-inducing paradox. Now, the knee-jerk objection here is to assert that the wards autological and heterological are neither autological nor heterological, but rather that there is some third category that we should assign them to. But this objection is easily overcome, because we can always simply choose to combine this third category with our second category, in order to ensure that there are only ever two total categories, in accordance with the principle of bivalency. That is, if we start by saying there are three categories, autological, heterological, and neither autological nor heterological, we can combine the heterological and neither autological nor heterological categories into one category, give it a new name, and simply repeat the paradox, ad infinitum. There's no way to escape bivalent classification, which leaves us reckoning with a terrible truth. Logic is broken. <sighs> Does all this leave you feeling like you're being subject to some sleight of hand, some logical ledger domain that's obscuring the reality of what's actually going on? Well, you're not alone in that feeling. Indeed, there's something awfully specious about using logic to prove that logic itself is broken. Well, with a language problem like this, it's pretty easy to shrug the whole thing off as a sort of curious mental exercise. Words are essentially arbitrary and meaningless at the end of the day anyway, right? So who cares? Well, before you come to that conclusion, we haven't told you everything about this paradox yet. The fact is, this paradox is actually a famous problem from mathematical set theory, known as Russell's paradox. It's just been translated from mathematical terms into linguistic ones. Moreover, Russell's paradox, when modified slightly and translated into a formal, self-referential, logical language, becomes something known as Gödel's incompleteness theorem. But it doesn't stop there. The paradox appears yet again in computability theory under the name of the halting problem. Three major, equally esoteric theorems all rely on the exact vein of logic presented here in order to demonstrate their famous and widely heralded conclusions. Indeed, if you could find even one tiny flaw in the reasoning presented here, well, you would strike a crack in an edifice which has dominated mathematical and philosophical thinking for well over a century. This has been Dialect. Stay tuned.